For those of you just joining us, welcome to the kickoff session of our Open Science webinar series. And with that, I will pass the mic over to Dawid, who will launch the series with an introduction of why open science is important to us and what we're doing to promote it. Dawid? Thanks, Kristen. And hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dawid Potgeter. Um, I uh, am super happy to see so many uh, familiar names and, and new names in the uh, participants list. It's uh, really exciting. Uh, I know some of you on here are already very familiar with open science. Some of you are judging by this probably know more than I do. Um, but uh, I, I also see that there, you know, there, there are some people here who are very new to the topic. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about why I think this is really important for us as a funder. And um, then, um, uh, you know, we might go over some of the, the slightly uh, sort of nuances, of particularly on uh, the foundation's new open access policy and why that's really important to us right now. Uh, but if you're new to open science, don't worry, because I'm uh, going to spend a bit of time as well talking about just the basics of open science and uh, you know, really how you can get started in this field and, and how you can get support in, in doing it well, if, if that's uh, something you're interested in. So what I will quickly do is uh, skip past, oh, okay, some, some duplicate introduction slides here. Let me start by telling you uh, a, a story and like every good story, uh, this one starts with a, a problem that I had to solve uh, back as a program officer, uh, trying to do some research on consciousness. You can see there are these two uh, uh, sort of, you know, columns, uh, you know, 12 different theories or groups of theories of consciousness. And back in 2017, I tried to uh, support research in this field. And for anyone who uh, has to spend money uh, when there are so many different theories to choose from and actually no, no clear, obvious way of which one's right or wrong, uh, that's incredibly daunting um, and, and pretty much an impossible task. So uh, what I did uh, is was really uh, the only thing that I, I tend to do, which is speak to other experts in the field and ask them what I should do. Uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of my job, ask other people what I should do. And um, what became clear uh, really uh, quickly is that the, the leaders of these theories, and there's, you know, for each one, there's you know probably uh, at least two or three people who who really know the theory well and can do experiments in that area, uh, and and for some of them many more. Uh, there were uh, leaders who were really keen to engage uh, with other theories and test them, and they uh, they were eager to do um, uh, you know tests that could confirm or oppose their work. But uh, that's incredibly difficult to do, and um, what we realized is that if we are going to see that kind of thing where different theories are going to be tested, we have to completely rethink the way that we do grants. And so uh, we came up with this new uh, mechanism called structured adversarial collaboration. And um, uh, this is this is my last slide on consciousness, by the way. So if, if you're not interested in consciousness, then then just, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be done soon. Um, what I just kind of wanted to show here is where uh, what we would normally have done in the past is do a call for proposals. And then, uh, you know, let's imagine we're just on two theories, they would have two research projects, two, you know, two different kinds of publications, and people could still have criticism between the theories, and it, you know, it would be legitimate. It, uh, but uh, it would still be a challenge because there wasn't that much, uh, you know, engagement throughout the research process. And so the structured adversarial collaboration that I've been working on for a, a few years now. And I'm actually delighted to see that some of the people who, who were involved in launching that and, and sort of running the first projects are here. So, so welcome guys and, and, and thanks for doing such a great job. Um, uh, this this uh, process, uh, the adversarial collaboration really involved collaborative research uh, uh, at every stage. So collaborative research design, conducting the research in a collaborative way. And uh, the reason I mention that is the only possible way we could pull this off, off and, and actually make it uh, work as well as it has done so far is through best practices in open science. It, it, the, the only way uh, this kind of thing, right, you know, people with such different ideas could work together for such a long period of time and have so much confidence in the work of, of the other people and you know, the field could have so much confidence in their work is because they shared everything 
and they were really transparent and really rigorous at every stage. And so I, I mentioned that as my introduction to, uh, to open science, what got me really excited about this field. And uh, you know, for us, that was the sort of start of a journey of, of uh, realizing, hey, this open science thing is, is kind of cool. It, it, you know, it helps us do better grants. And um, uh, you know, from that, I, I, I want to just kind of hop back into the basics uh, because you know, some of you might be wondering, well, you know, what, what is open science? Uh, uh, is, is this a thing we should pay attention to? And um, uh, there are lots of different definitions of this topic, um, you know, it's it's sometimes described as a movement. Uh, here, I'm just going to think of it as a collection of practices, uh, just a bunch of things that 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 people do uh, to enhance their transparency and accountability, and it, it exists throughout the scientific process from the beginning, from the start, where you think, okay, here's how I'm going to design my experiment, all the way up to how you share your data in the end and and uh, allow replication. So um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go over all of these different practices. We are going to get to some of them a bit later on. Uh, but very quickly, uh, these could be divided into sort of you know, three, three different uh, uh, groups of practices. There's giving people open access to your work. Um, just everything you do, give open access, make sure it's nice and tidy and accessible and readable um, and searchable and so on. Um, and then there's also uh, you know, two other categories. Uh, one is being open about your predictions, so that uh, obviously, you know, uh, scientific research not always, but uh, a, a lot of the time in, in hypothesis testing is about testing a prediction and being uh, clear, giving people the confidence that what you're reporting on is really a prediction, not something that um, was sort of you know just came out of the the data. And then finally, being open to reevaluation. So um, making it easy and um, possible for people to see if they can replicate your work or see if other work can be replicated. Uh, we know just, you know, by the way, that uh, this uh, sort of statistical methods that are being used, that um, it is important uh, sometimes to try to replicate work. And I know some people do that anyway. Some of you do it all the time. Um, but for other people, it's you know it's in a field where one kind of has to go the extra mile sometimes to to do replication. So those three things are uh, really important to us. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, you know why the foundation is taking a particular interest in this, and then sort of what they are, what work we're doing in the field um, for um, for those who who are new to it. So. Just coming back to this idea of, uh, you know, why why is this the thing for for TWCF? And um, you know, we, we have sort of two, uh, you know, two particular uh, areas where we think open science is really really crucial for our mission, um, and and they're just listed here. Uh, you know, to have impactful findings, you have to uh, have uh, rigorous evidence. Uh, you know, and, and this this could be you know, a partly sort of paraphrased all the way from uh, Carl Sagan's famous uh, phrase of you know extraordinary claims require uh, extraordinary evidence. Um, I'm I'm not saying that we always make extraordinary claims, not at all. But uh, obviously, as a as a foundation, what we hope to do is fund research that's going to have an impact at some stage. And uh, if if you have that kind of ambition, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that. Uh, the evidence is as robust as it can be, and, you know, and, and as easy to test and evaluate as possible. So um, then uh, there's also this idea of, you know, with Templeton World Charity Foundation, we, we work hard to uh, have a global reach, and, and that requires global engagement, and we're very aware of, um, you know, issues of, 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 of access and equity, where uh, a lot of the, you know, people around the world just don't have access to um, the the uh, original research papers, and and that that's a that's a problem, and it's it's not one of the easy solution, but we we think it's one that's uh, still worth trying to solve. So um, here is uh, what has inspired our particular process or, or our approach to open science, and um, I have a, a shamelessly stolen this from a presentation that Brian Osek did. Uh, a, a few months ago, uh, you can, if you have your, your 
you, you can't like copy and paste things. So if you have your camera, you could just scan the QR code for, for this presentation. Uh, by the way, uh, Center for Open Science have all their presentations um, on the Open Science Framework. So if you see one you like, you can just go there and, and you know, uh, borrow their slides. Um, there's this idea that if you want to, um, uh, you know, promote a particular change in the culture here, we want to promote people, uh, you know, being able to share their work, being more open about their work, uh, you're going to encounter lots of different people. So there's, you know, the innovators, the early adopters, early majority, late majority, and then, you know, the, the, the people who didn't really do anything until the very end. And to help this different group of people, uh, you have to do lots of different things. So uh, everybody is going to need infrastructure. They need something that will make it possible to uh, you know, engage in these best practices. Um, other people, uh, well, they need a better user experience. Uh, it's fine if it's possible, but they also kind of need it a bit easier because they're not going to put in all the extra effort. They're very busy already. Um, then for the early majority, um, you know, they, they kind of need it to be possible, easy enough, and it needs to be normative. And then, um, you know, coming towards the late majority and, and the laggards, uh, one needs to have more incentives to make open science rewarding and uh, uh, policies to make it required. And I'm going to, you know, I've, I sort of wanted to mention this as a, a preface to, to my, my next uh, slides. Uh, because at the foundation, we have done a number of things in, in the, this space. Um, and we actually think it's really important to try to um, engage at these different levels. I Now, I, I'll definitely be, be quick to admit we haven't engaged at all these levels uh, extremely well. We've only been in this game for a, a couple of years. And actually, this webinar series is uh, you know one of our attempts to make open science a little bit easier uh, for, for people who are, are less familiar to it. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're still trying to innovate and work in this space, but as a, uh, as a general rule, and also something that, that I, I really want to share with everyone on this call, uh, when it comes to promoting open science, it's, it's not enough to just do one thing. Um, and that's why we're trying to do a, a whole number of things. Um, so, uh, here is what we're doing so far. I'm going to go through six different kinds of initiatives that we are, um, you know, that we've either, either done recently or, or uh, working on. And uh, this this really is uh, probably the sort of main substance of my presentation today, uh, talking about what we're doing and why it's important to us. And and hopefully, uh, this will firstly, you know, make it easier for, for for some of you to know where to get help or know how to do things. Uh, or if if you uh, you feel inspired and and also want to do something like that, then then you know you can reach out to us and and we'd love to help you. So um, just starting off with our um, open access policy, this is a policy that aligns with Plan S. Some of you uh, would be familiar with with Coalition S, um, uh, launched by folks at, at, at the Wellcome Trust and European Science Foundation and Gates and so on. Um, and uh, Plan S is essentially um, uh, or all about open access publishing. You can go on that link. Sorry, I don't have a QR code for it, but you can go on, on that link because our open access policy. And uh, this is the one element where I, I am actually going to go through the policy a little bit because we've had a number of questions on this and I, I would love to explain it uh, a little bit more. So um, if you go to our open access policy, you will see a bit more text, um, but something that's a little bit like this. And um, uh, gosh, that's a that's a lot of text. I'm sorry, I should have uh, I made it so it appears in in little slides. But um, anyway, just just going going through it from the top. Um, it's important uh, for publications that result from from the research we fund uh, to be published in open access journals or open access platforms, and uh, you know, or to be made immediately available through open access repositories without embargo. And so uh, that means you can still publish wherever you like. We're not telling you which journal you should be publishing in, it's up to you. But somewhere, something has to be open access. And this comes to uh, the idea that, you know, we want people to be able to see our work. And if, every, if everything's behind a paywall, it's going to be uh, you know, difficult for, for people to see it. Um, so uh, 
the the you know big part of that is that we require that authors and their institutions retain sufficient rights to their research articles um and and this is something that i mean many of you will, will know this already sometimes journals actually you know they take the right and and you have no more rights over your articles uh this is a really important part of plan s and and one that we stand behind uh is the idea that if you're an author um and and you published something then then you should you should uh, retain the rights uh to that article if um uh, you know so that you can make it open access um it can be made uh freely available under create creative commons license so it, it doesn't mean that you can't share with anybody but you know uh the, the authors have to have the right it can be shared under a ccby license um and if you have to publish in a, a journal that requires a uh, article processing charge or APC, then um, we will uh, we will support that, providing it's in a journal that is um, either a fully open access journal or has a transformative arrangement. And um, then we also have a uh, you know we're not just about sharing articles we're also about sharing data and software and so on we don't yet have a policy on data and software but we encourage people to to make it clear where you know where readers can access uh their data so these five bullet points here are a summary of of plan s if you have any uh questions about it i i would encourage you to go on our website and and read the full text this is just a sort of a paraphrased summary to get it on as as, in as small a space as possible um and this will apply for um uh, all of the grants that we make right now it does not apply to some of our really historic grants uh if if you're a, a grantee right now and you're wondering whether the plan asset policy applies to you you can go and look at your grant agreement um that will uh either you know, make a reference to the policy or, or not. Uh, so it's a policy that was implemented quite recently and, and therefore, uh, you know, contractually doesn't yet apply to, to everybody, but, but to some people it does. Um, and uh, in, in a nutshell, if, if you're, um, you know, as I've you know, kind of talked a lot, if, if you're wondering what's Plan S or, or, or people, you know, ask you about it, it, it really is all about uh, giving the author uh, the ability to sort of just retain rights over their paper and making sure that somebody somewhere can can read it. I mean, it's it's more nuanced than that, but but the point is, you know, our our goal is about giving giving the the rights to the authors, uh, not about telling them where they should publish or or where not. Um, we have had uh, a few situations or heard of. We haven't encountered this ourselves, but we we've, we've heard of situations where journals are. Uh, uh, you know, don't always like the idea of of having to make articles freely available. But um, as part of Coalition S, um, as, as as far as I know, uh, uh, journals have respected this for any Coalition S funders. So um, uh, you know, it's it's something we have great confidence in. And if you ever have any challenges, uh, you know, publishing un under this policy. Uh, you can email us uh, as you, Kristen gave the email address open at templetonworldcharity.org and, and we can help you figure that out. So um, this, I kind of uh, lingered on this a little bit longer than I have done for other, uh, or, or that, than, I, than I will for uh, other activities, just because this is such a, such a very important part of, of our interests. Um, I'll quickly go over the other uh, five things that we're really interested in. Uh, so just coming back, to, to this, this list, um, along with our, our enthusiasm for open access publishing is uh, reimagining the, uh, or you know, aligning with, 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 with a reimagined vision of, of research assessment. Uh, we have a policy that aligns with, uh, with the Declaration on Research Assessment, DORA. Um, again, you can go and, and have a look there uh, on our website. What that means in a nutshell, uh, from the foundation's point of view, um, we don't believe in relying on um, a simple publication metrics such as impact factor. Um, we, we're, we're moving away from impact factor as a, as a proxy for quality, and we're moving towards uh, other 
indicators of quality. Uh, for example, uh, you know, things like published data, published code, um, you know, detailed results, methods, and so on. Uh, part of this in support of the open access policy is to um, uh, you know, move towards rewarding researchers for all the open access things that they do, rather than just uh, audio. Am I back? Okay, yeah, sorry about that. I didn't know what happened. Um, uh, I should check my headphones. Um, anyway, uh, I, I, but what I, what I just said wasn't important anyway. Uh, so, so, so the bit that that you missed uh, uh, is is fine. Um, but anyway, the 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 point for us is we really want to encourage all of our grantees to be able to uh, publish uh, their work open access, publish their data, and our research assessment policy is is uh, steps to encourage that uh, more broadly. So other things that we have um, uh, focused on and um, uh, is is infrastructure plans. This is uh, some of these are still in progress. You know, we, in, in in terms of of training, we we uh, uh, hope to launch more training efforts. But our our series of webinars uh, is is a first step in that direction. Which, by the way, if you have suggestions for things you really want to know. Uh, you know, we plan webinars sort of, you know, maybe three, four months in advance. If there are things you really want to know, tell us uh, and and we could get a webinar on that. If there's enough people who really want to know something on a topic, we will set up a webinar to to uh, to provide uh, teaching on that. Um, we're also working on getting things like grant DOIs and, and, and repository access so that it's easier for our grantees to make their work open. Um, now we have a series of uh, uh, sort of signature grant projects in in the making. There's the adversarial collaborations that I mentioned earlier. We've now uh, funded three of those and have a a, a couple more um, in the pipeline. And um, they are definitely the most rigorous <laughs> research projects I've ever seen. So I'm I'm very very pleased uh, about those. Uh, but we also uh, plan to embed our open science um, goals and and framework in the development of new portfolios. So um, that that could involve signature projects that are specifically about encouraging open science, but it could also be um, you know uh, uh, something to boost a project by uh, providing resources to follow best practices in open science. Um, we've also done some work in realigning incentives uh, in the way that we've updated our proposals, review forms, and update reports. Um, and this is something that a number of foundations have done, and I was very grateful that they shared their language with us, uh, made it much easier. But essentially, if you apply to the foundation now, uh, or if you um, send an update report, or if you're a reviewer, there will be questions on the extent to which um, you know, applicants or grantees engage in open science practices. And, and there'll be opportunities for you to share that, share your links, uh, tell us what you've done. And we, we do look at those things and we really value projects and, and people who are engaged in best practices in open science. Uh, you know, for the reasons I had mentioned earlier, uh, we believe those practices can make, uh, you can increase the, the, the rigor of uh, of, of the evidence. I'm not saying that if you follow these best practices or your research is going to be perfect. No, not, not at all. Uh, but if it's open uh, and people can access it and people can evaluate it, if there's a mistake, it's much easier to find. And, um, uh, you know, as a, as a general thing, it, it, it then makes it easier to, to fix things and make them better. And, and, and we're all for that. And finally, um, we are uh, very lucky as a, as a, uh, an organization to to be a, a member of a couple of other um, uh, funder communities like the Open Research Funders Group and the, the Health Research Alliance and, and, and Coalition S and so on. Um, I mentioned that because oh and and yeah, Kristen just uh, um, posted a link there. Um, uh, if we didn't know an answer to something. I, I bet that uh, somebody at one of the other organizations will. In fact, I uh, mostly ask them for their opinion on things. Um, and so if, if uh, you're a grantee 
uh, or a, you know, a potential applicant or, or partner and and you have questions for us about our work or there's something that you're struggling with and and need some some guidance on if we can't find the answer um, you know we, we can go and and reach out to to somebody else who might have it uh, and and we're really keen to do that as much as we can so um, just sort of to summarize uh, uh, why is open science important to us? Uh, well, we think it leads to better research and uh, more impact uh, globally. And uh, we also think that if to promote open science, one has to do a lot of different things to make it accessible and easy and more normative and required um, and, and rewarding. And uh, we're certainly, uh, you know, haven't quite gotten there yet, but the, the things we're trying to do right now is uh, promote open access and, and better research assessment through our policies, through infrastructure, rethinking our grants and incentives and, and the way we engage with the community. Um, so if you are, uh, are someone who has thoughts about that, uh, you know, you can uh, ask, ask a question or if you have suggestions on how we can do it better or do something else, we'd really love to hear from you. Uh, you know, send an email and um, uh, you know, we'd, we'd love to, to learn. Um, now, just looking ahead at our uh, webinars and um, I see I'm see, I'm almost uh, coming to time here for my presentation and then we can have a, a, a discussion and, and, and answer some questions and so on. Um, today, uh, we are you know, just talking about, um, uh, you know, sort of various uh, things of you know, why this is important to us, but uh, we will have a bunch of uh, really great seminars coming up. Uh, next one is on July the 8th on where to start with open science, how you can get involved in, in practices that, that you may not have uh, been in before, uh, you know, pre-registration, registered reports, uh, sharing your data, sharing your codes, registering your protocols, etc. I doubt we'll deal with all of them in, in one session, but those are things we'll, uh, that, that you can um, uh, learn about throughout these sessions. And, and certainly uh, learning where to start in next month would, would be very useful. Uh, and then we are going to go through specific kinds of practices um, you know, over the next few months of sharing articles, sharing data, pre-registration and so on. And uh, we also want to hear from you. If if there are practices that you have heard about and don't really know how to do and you'd love to learn about it, uh, let us know. Um, or if there's something that you think foundations ought to be doing uh, and, and you'd love a discussion about that, then, you know, uh, send us an email as well. Um, I think what we're going to do now, I'm not sure if I'm coming to the end of, uh, yeah, this is my, my last slide. So uh, this is now a, a time for uh, either questions or discussions, uh, or if anybody is really keen for an early lunch, we finish early, that's fine too. Um, what we're going to do is, uh, I, I see there are some questions in, in the Q&A session uh, or, or Q&A section. Uh, Kristen's going to send me the questions and I will answer a few of them uh, as, as, as much as I can. When, the, when we're done with the questions, um, we will actually open this up for a discussion. So if, if you have, uh, if, if you think that uh, uh, you'd rather ask a question now or, or join the discussion instead of sending an email, that's great as well. We'd, we'd love to talk to you. Please uh, remember though that this is recorded, uh, but I'm, you know, I, I, I look forward to a great discussion. So. Um, with that, I will just start uh, opening my chat here. Uh, what I'm going to do is stop my screen sharing so that you can just see me. Um, and hopefully that worked. And I will start just scrolling down the chat, uh, looking for some questions. Um, Okay, so there's a question here about talking a bit more about the implications of uh, open science for qualitative researchers. Um, so I'm just, uh, there's been quite a significant debate in various disciplines of the social sciences about this issue. Um, 
and, and, and the person who asked it is most familiar with political science and the DART debates, data access and research transparency, uh, which received significant pushback from uh, qualitative political scientists for various reasons, including ethical considerations. Uh, that is a really good question. So uh, I think uh, sort of, uh, where this might be going is, is the idea of, can you really share something that should be confidential? Um, and in in a lot of other disciplines, there's also this idea of like, look, if you share all your data of a human subject, you know, even if it's like an MRI scan or something, uh, a person could be identified. And so, can you can you share something that you know that that should remain confidential? Uh, our position on that, and I, th I think a number of of other uh, organizations are as well, uh, is that uh, share what's possible. Um, and you know, keep things as closed as as you you have to, right? So, uh, yes, if there is a good ethical reason why data has to be kept confidential, we will respect that. Um, but that doesn't mean everything about the study has to be kept confidential. Um, so it could be that some aspects of uh, the the protocol, or maybe some aspects of the study design, or uh, or analysis methods, could could be made available. Um, I'm definitely not an, an expert in, in uh, social science. Um, so if this is an issue where there's a specific challenge that you're facing, you can you know, uh, uh, you hop on the mic or, or send us an email. Um, but just in, in response to the question of like, how, how far are we going to push this open thing? Um, we are, uh, we're very aware that sometimes there are ethical considerations and, and we, we will respect those. Um, so as open as, as possible and as closed as necessary. Just moving on to the next question here. Um, what would be the policy with mixed journals like the ones that charge authors and at the same time sell the issues? Uh, these are usually more established ones. Yeah, that's a really good question. So this comes to the idea of open access and um, will the foundation pay an article processing charge to a journal that also uh, has a subscription? And uh, this is something we've had lots of, <laughs> lots of conversations about uh, because those journals, as, as is mentioned here, are, are not just more established ones, but sometimes they are the better quality ones. Oh, well, actually, I say better quality. I'm sorry, that, that that's completely the wrong uh, word. They are perceived as better quality. I, I don't want to say that uh, a journal is better quality just, just because it's more established. Uh, and that's definitely not always the case. So these journals could be perceived as better quality. They could be uh, ones where people would prefer to publish. Um, and there, it depends on whether the journal has a transformative agreement. So if there's a journal that is both open access and has uh, 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 a subscription, then we won't pay the APC unless it has a transformative agreement. And that means that it's open access and um, subscription. And over time, it's going to become less subscription and more open access until it can be fully open access and everything is paid by APCs. So if a journal has that, then we're willing to pay the APC. If it doesn't, then we will simply treat it as a subscription journal. You could still publish there and make things open access. That's completely fine. We just can't pay for the APC. That's that's the, uh, the important part. Um, there is a tool called the Journal Checker Tool. I think you can Google it, or Kristen might uh, post a link in the chat, uh, which will explain this. Uh, well, not necessarily explains, but it will point out whether you can publish there or not. So you can. Uh, you know, go select your funder, TWCF. Uh, thanks, thanks, Kristen. There, there is a uh, uh, journal checker tool.org. Um, say who the funder is, say who the journal is, your institution, so on. And it will tell you whether that journal complies with our policy. Um, so, uh, a question on have we received feedback from grantees about new open science policies? Um, we've, we've received questions about these policies. Um, and uh, we received feedback, uh, sort of general, like, yes, thanks for doing this kind of feedback. Um, I'm uh, not sure whether there's any sort of particular feedback in mind behind the questions. 
Uh, one thing I will mention about these policies is, as you've noticed, they're both tied to two other initiatives. So the open access one is tied to Coalition S and, and the uh, uh, research uh, um, assessment is tied to DORA. And that's because as a you know, relatively uh, new foundation, we really prefer to work with larger foundations who have had a lot of feedback in these areas. And certainly, um, you know, Coalition S and, and DORA have, have worked here for a long time, received a lot of feedback from different um, researchers. So we have confidence in these policies, but if, if there's any particular kind of feedback somebody would like to give us, again, send us an email or, or, or you can uh, you know, come on the mic in, in a few minutes. Um, next question to uh, speak to the, um... oh, no, there are no, no more questions. There was just, uh... Uh, one about people could uh, raise their hands. Uh, so yeah, if, if you'd like to ask a question in person, you could raise your hand. Um, okay, there is one more question here. And, and what we're going to do, uh, I think now is actually, if, if you want to ask a question, now's a good time to start raising your hands. Um, and what we'll do is we'll just take hands in the order that they are raised. And um, we'll, uh, you know, We'll, we'll let you use your mic um, and, and, and come on and chat to us. So um, next question, how does TWCF plan to address fair principles of open data sharing? Uh, will some of this become a policy in the future? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, so fair, the fair principles of open data sharing um, really require that scientific research data should be uh, FAIR, which is an acronym for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I think those are the four. I, if I got it wrong, uh, then I apologize. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the point is, data is not something that you just share. Um, it's, it's not just a file that you put on GitHub or wherever. It's got to be something that can be found, uh, you know, linked to the article, or, or linked to the question or what you reported. You have to be able to find it. It has to be something that can be ex accessed. It's got to be in a file format that people can use, not just like a you know, particular program that you just wrote by yourself. Um, being interoperable is one of the most challenging, uh, but possibly also most important parts of FAIR, uh, which is essentially, uh, you know, it, it's got to be something that someone can search and use other algorithms to, to process using maybe different software. Um, and that that can be really difficult to do because it means you have to you know, share your data in in a format that uh, that might not be the one you're, you've uh, uh, worked in. Um, to share data in, you know, according to the FAIR principles is something we recognize as really important and it probably will become a policy in the future. But as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we, we talked about the uh, the need for infrastructure and and making things easy and, and normative and rewarding and uh, uh, necessary. Um, when it comes to sharing data, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be implemented, and um, we uh, would you know would gladly uh, support the development of new infrastructure um, where we're sort of starting to um, think about that. Um, we're, we're not going to become an infrastructure foundation, so we can't just spend everything on infrastructure. Uh, but the answer is there's a, quite a lot more infrastructure would be needed before it's easy enough for people to share their data uh, according to the FAIR principles. Um, and we don't really want to make it a policy until we can sort of make that at least doable. Uh, but I would encourage everybody who can to share uh, their data and and make it fair. Um, and I see there's also a, a great uh, a, a link here to the fair um, uh, fair principles. Oh, and I did get it right, uh, reusable. Um, so that's uh, uh, that's pretty fun. Um, another question here. So uh, I saw see there's sort of just one or two questions here at a time. So if anybody wants to raise hands, by the way, I don't mind you not raising hands because, you know, if someone raises a hand and asks me a tough question, I'll be on the spot. Uh, but 
uh, you know, we, we want to make this kind of webinar a uh, an opportunity for you to have a chat with us as well, if you'd like to. So if you have a question, you want to raise your hand uh, or just comment, that's that's completely fine. Um, so uh, and, you know, I'll just kind of answer these questions as they come up then. Um, are there kinds of science that are more suited to open science practices and pre-registration, um, like psychology or, or other ones? Um, yes, and uh, I think as as we just uh, you know heard that in some some disciplines, in social science, political science, and so on, uh, uh, using qualitative methods, it's a bit more difficult. Uh, I'm a biochemist by training, uh, but I did did my my DPhil in neuroscience. And uh, in some of those disciplines, like you know, biochemistry, people often do a lot of replication anyway. Um, I mean, not everything, but the, the sort of a lot of experiments have have elements of replication to them. So there, I you know, forcing replication might not be such a big deal. Um, but then in other disciplines, it's it's uh, uh, less common, but no less important. So uh, we do fund research across a wide range of disciplines and uh, uh, you know that's that's also why we have this these webinars and, and, and an email address where you can contact us if you have questions uh, because it might be that you work in a discipline that you know we haven't yet heard of the challenges there and if that's the case we really want to hear from you uh, because you know we in in this sort of journey to to uh, promoting open science we see our um, uh, our grantees is, you know, people who we could we could partner with to um, in, increase the rigor of science. So, so we want to make it, um, you know, easier and, and more possible and, and help if, if we can. Um, so we also recognize that, you know, your discipline might be more difficult than others. Um, okay, the open access policy. Um, on oh, a question on how to uh, access article processing charges. Um, so we have the the best way to um, sort of fund article processing charges. So for those new, uh, new to to the open access uh, policy idea, this is that if you are a recent grantee and you're going to publish your uh, or, no, or maybe an applicant and you're going to publish your uh, paper and you want to make it open and you want to publish it in a journal that charges an article processing charge instead of just you know publishing in a subscription journal and then putting it in a repository or something like that um, you know, how do you get the money for for the APC um, these vary uh, quite a lot uh, from like you know a few hundred dollars maybe to a few thousand uh, maybe more for the really expensive journals um, and this is something that you can, in an application, if if you, you know, if you're still applying or haven't applied yet, you can uh, you know ask for that money uh, in in part of your budget. Uh, that's sort of the the preferred way. Um, or if you don't have that, uh, you know, let's say you haven't done it, or you you know you you're exceeding it because you're such a productive uh, publisher and 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 you've spent uh, all the APC money, you can come to us and uh, we have a small budget that we can use to help um, uh, help people cover their their APCs. So again, send us an email and and we can help you sort that out. Um, so um, I'll see a, a question here about. Um, uh, special programs for um, researchers in developing countries um, because uh, a lot of the time uh, you know uh, open access is a um, uh, you know is less of an issue if you're at a huge research institution that can afford big subscription fees to all the journals um, that is true and uh, you know so so just our our policy to make research articles open access is is one way of um, trying to address that problem in the long run. At least, the the papers that we we support uh, should be open to to researchers in in the developing world. Uh, we are exploring uh, more opportunities in that field. Um, 
and I, I mean, I, I don't know who asked the question, but if, if you have a, a suggestion there, you could, you know, send us, send us an email. Um, it, I mean, something we can't do is simply sort of, you know, pay all the subscriptions for uh, a, a, a very large area. Um, but something we really would like to do is make it uh, much easier for, um, you know, groups to, to share their information and, and collaborate um, and certainly make sure that the, the data that comes from research we fund is accessible to, to everybody. Um, we do have some programs uh, in the developing world for researchers that are not specifically on open science. So that's you know, global innovations for character uh, development um, is, is one and, and, and that's on our website. Uh, but I didn't know if that's quite what's, what's being asked here because um, that's, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty big program and, and it's, uh, as far as I know, been, been quite successful, but it's not specifically on, on open science. Um, so um, it does look like we have almost run out of questions and uh, either the attendee hands I can't see um, or it doesn't look like we have any up. So uh, we could let people go to an early lunch and I'm gonna tell myself that the information was um, uh, transferred very uh, efficiently rather than uh, very dull. Um, so <laughs> we could go and um, you know, give, uh, give you 10 minutes uh, of the day back. Um, unless if somebody has a question now, I'll, I think uh, what we can do is sort of make this the formal end of, of the webinar and I will stay online for another two minutes. Um, if anybody wants to just have a chat at the end or something like that, uh, or if any other questions pop up, happy to do that. Uh, but I think aside from that, we'll, you know, we'll make this with the end of, of the webinar. And uh, I, I have really enjoyed speaking to all of you. So thank you very much for coming. It's really great to see so many names on this list. Um, I'm really, I'm actually even more excited about our next webinar. Um, that's going to be um, uh, really cool. And maybe Kristen, can I let you uh, talk about the next one because I have forgotten the details of it, um, and then maybe I'll I'll go down uh, back to any any last questions. Yeah, thanks, Dawid. And I'm also going to um, I'll link the uh, for the registration into the uh, the chat area as well. Um, so the next uh, event of our series is on July 8th, same time. Um, the Center of Open Science will be joining us to talk about uh, overcoming the knowledge and training barrier and getting started with open science. Um, yeah, so that's, I think I'm really looking forward to that one. I think it'd be great. Um, and please register below. And also doubt it before you, um, I don't think there's any other questions, but I also just wanna say, um, again, to please respond to the survey that will pop up as soon as you leave the webinar um, um, or just send us an email at open at templetonworldcharity.org for any feedback. And like Dawid said earlier, any topic that you would like us to um, bring experts um, in this space for, would be great. Um, Awesome, Good. thanks, Kristen. So yeah, I'll 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 chill out here for for two minutes. If there's anybody who who uh, has any thoughts or ideas, but um, yeah, this was a, a great, exciting webinar. And I'm really looking forward to the next one as well. Um, so that's going to be great. Definitely sign up for that. Thank you, Dawid. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone else for coming as well. <laughs>